Law firm success strategies will begin after a brief word from today's sponsor, Answering Legal. Visit AnsweringLegal.com to learn more about our virtual receptionist team. Answering Legal has been pivotal to allow our virtual law firm to thrive. Without them, we would not be able to handle the call volume that comes to our law firm. We needed a service that would allow us to be able to take those messages, yet still focus on working with our clients and be able to call them back. Answering Legal has been phenomenal on getting a great customer service relationship with people that are calling into the firm, taking messages, giving us those messages, and we can get back to them very shortly. Hey there, and welcome to the Law Firm Success Strategies Podcast. You know, we created this show because there are so many lawyers out there who have stepped into business roles and that nobody really trained them for, not in law school or other places. And so I thought, let's create this podcast to help those people um, learn what they need to know to be the best leader they can be, to grow their firm so they can make more money in less time and enjoy life and keep the people that that they want to have. So that's our goal for the show. I'm Doug Brown, a former practicing lawyer turned executive coach. And that's what I do with my clients, help them become the best leader and CEO they can be. And I'm thrilled to welcome Carl Fix to uh, the show today. Carl works with leaders and their teams to help them increase productivity, improve engagement, and resolve conflict gracefully and problem solve and do lots of other things with emotional intelligence. And I've known Carl for a while and we've had Carl so many good conversations on the phone. I'm excited that we finally get a chance to record one in this format. Carl is the founder of No Surrender LLC. It's a focus on helping those leaders engage and inspire their teams. And um, unlike me, Carl is an endurance athlete um, rides, a, he'll tell us how many miles a day he rides. He's a frequent guest on leadership and business and legal podcast. And recently he was a contributing editor to the success slash self-help book, The Difference, essays on lost courage, on loss, comma, courage and personal transformation. I loved Carl reading your story in that book. I, I'd known you for a while and I didn't know those things. Thank you, Doug. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's an honor, and I look forward to our conversation. Yeah, so let's you know jump into it. Our our big topic today is um, because there's so many we could choose from, but is how a lawyer's emotional intelligence impacts the performance of their team and their firm's profit. Now, I, the where I think a place I'd like to start is you know in my work with lawyers, they get the topic of IQ intelligence. But I'm, and I think that they think that IQ is like the key to success. And here we are talking about this thing called emotional intelligence. I don't know about you, but I don't think lawyers like to talk about emotions. So, so what is this emotional intelligence thing? Well, uh, emotional intelligence distilled into its simplest terms is your ability to recognize, understand, and manage emotions in both yourself and others. So that might be the dictionary definition, but basically it's a couple of skills par paired under a few competencies. You have a mm -hmm. personal competence, which is self-awareness and self-management. And then you have social competence, which is social awareness and relationship management. The self-awareness is basically what you feel. Self-management is what you do. Social awareness, what you feel. Relationship management, what you do. And it's basically how you navigate the world. You know, lawyers are an interesting breed, having practiced, you obviously practiced, I practiced for 30 plus years. Ultra competitive, uh, very aggressive at times, very achievement oriented. Uh, and I think lawyers are taught at a young age to, in fact, ignore emotion because it may be a sign of weakness or it doesn't contribute to the bottom line. But that simply is not the case. Yeah, it's, it's almost like we're taught in law school to ignore our feelings. It's easy to joke, right? Well, I'm, you know, I'm a lawyer. I don't have feelings. But, <laughs> but 
Um, you know, is this something that lawyers are, and people are just born with? I mean, do they just, is it like a, a native IQ thing that you just either have it or you don't? It is not. In fact, IQ is pretty static, although I'll, I'll share a little tidbit on that in a minute. But EQ is like a muscle. It's like resilience. It's a muscle that needs to be worked and it needs to be uh, attended to. And it needs to, in fact, stay in shape. So you can bump up your EQ and there are great benefits, especially in the practice of law. Uh, back to the IQ for a minute. There was just a, a study that came out Northwestern University for the first time in decades. IQs are actually going down in the 18 to 25 uh, age bracket, which is a stunning uh, turn of events because Traditionally, it's it's six, seven, eight, nine decades where IQs have continually increased. Uh, for the first time in in that space, uh, they have begun to decline. So that's alarming. Um, but EQ is definitely something you can work on, and in fact, should work on. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, Carl, about your experience. And I know you spend a lot of time doing a lot of different things. Um, how how did you get interested in in this topic and and I know you spend a lot of time working with leaders on this. Why, why does it matter? It matters because uh, we are all humans. So there's a lot of obvious interaction, and I'm a an observer of mankind. I do like to observe, and since I was a little kid, uh, I had a paper route when I was a little kid, door to door, seven days a week. 5.30 in the morning. And I would observe what's going on in the neighborhood. I would get the ebb and flow. I would know who got up early, who didn't got, get up early, who came in late. Uh, so I always kind of tried to have my finger on the pulse of things. And then when I was in college, thinking of law school, I was a messenger at a very, very large law firm. And that was an interesting job because <laughs> messengers, we kind of were treated like half persons. We weren't even recognized. But as a result, I could um, observe what was going on. And I noticed that the support staff, the administrative staff, they really had a lot of juice vis-a-vis -vis the lawyers. And some of them were not treated too well by the lawyers. And I remember making a mental note that, hmm, okay, the support slash admin staff is really uh, the oil that runs the machine. And note to self, when I get out of law school, uh, treat the support staff very well, and it will pay benefits. So it's really human interaction. People are leaving. We can, we'll talk in a bit about a uh, study from Law 360 or the article from Law 360. Young lawyers want to be recognized. They want to, they want to be treated like humans. And you and I may not have grown up in uh, a system that recognized us as such. Yeah, I remember when I started practicing law in the early 90s, you were putting yourself last. I mean, there wasn't any conversation about work-life balance or humanizing, or it, it was come and come and do your job. In fact, I've thought about it over the years. It seems like our our profession teams tends to dehumanize people. Um, I I would agree with that. It was here are your billable hours, and you know this is ironic, Doug, because I passed the bar in 1988. And billable hours was a huge topic in 1988. And the consensus was within five years, the billable hour will be gone. Well, it's 2024. The billable hour rages on. It's stronger than ever. Uh, there's a focus on attorney well-being, rightfully so. Um, and I'm involved in that. And, uh, you know, I speak on it. I train on it. But I do at times get this vibe like the attorney well-being is the new billable hour that we need to pay attention to it. But are we simply checking boxes and not really taking a deep dive and, and approaching it from a different angle? Um, I've, I've spoken to many young lawyers who really have no interest in being an equity partner at a law firm. And that was the stick and carrot back in 88, it was, I'm going to grind, grind, grind. And hopefully in year eight, I will be an equity partner. That was my singular goal. Now it's, it's a different generation and it's not, it's not indifference. It's well, there might be something else out there for me. 
And as a result, the leadership in law firms needs to be more nimble and more responsive to this new crop of attorneys that's entering the workforce. Yeah, I've, I've found I've found the same thing. Uh, and there's this I, I sent I sense this resentment. I hear about the resentment that some of the the lawyers of our generation feel where, um, you know, we didn't get to have work life balance. Why can't you just do your job? And and I think, uh, you know, my experience is that gets in the way. And so one of the things as I'm talking about uh, working with them on on leadership and and communication and delegation and those sorts of things is related to something that they I know that they care about. And most lawyers care about getting clients, making money, trying to um, be efficient and effective, having good reputations. So how does this EQ developing, investing in developing your own EQ, paying attention to how you show up in the world, um, how does that help firms? Um, if, if you were trying to explain to a lawyer that you should invest in this because it it helps you improve your tangible metrics, your bottom line, can you talk about that? Sure. I think um, an emotionally intelligent lawyer has, number one, is more attuned to the truth. Number two, has better coping skills. Number three, has higher production. Uh, number four, communicates better. Um, number five, can assess risk better and is more resilient. And they're not only uh, on the production, the actual filling out of the timesheet, but uh, let's talk for a minute about risk or liability to a law firm. Uh, lawyers live in fear, uh, many of them, of being grieved. And uh, so many of the grievances arise out of a lack of communication mm. and emotionally intelligent lawyers communicate better. Uh, the number one complaint in my 30 plus year career when I would talk to somebody who was not a client, but a friend is when their lawyer would not call them back or would not communicate with them. Mm. Uh, but emotionally intelligent lawyers do in fact communicate uh, better. They because their fingers are on the pulse of their adversary, uh, their colleagues and their clients. And they they have they can read a room and they may not need to go scorched earth in a communication. They might want to throttle back and that pays dividends. Yeah, it's fascinating because you you were a litigator, right? Yes. And did you find that? being able to use emotional intelligence and read the room, read a jury, read a witness, did that make you a better lawyer? Did it get you better outcomes? It, it absolutely did. And I'll, I'll, give you a, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was involved in Connecticut. There was, um, in the last 10 years, there was this defective concrete litigation mm -hmm. where the concrete in the foundation of a house was actually crumbling due to a certain mineral that was in the rock that made the concrete. It was an extremely emotional thing for the homeowners. So what they were doing is they were filing for declaratory judgments with their insurance carriers saying, my house is collapsing. This is a collapse under the policy. You, insurance carrier, need to uh, replace my foundation. My firm represented the insurance carriers, and I was deeply involved in that. In one deposition, for instance, the... Uh, the witness was a police officer and for a long time was an officer in New York City, uh, since moved to the suburbs. For many reasons that I need not go into, uh, he got deep. He was very, very emotional in the deposition, personal reasons. And I recognized this and I thought, OK, I could go one of two ways. I can step on this guy's neck and not let him up off the canvas. Or I can pull back and look at his lawyer and say, let's take a break. I chose door number two. And I just got up. I told the court reporter, we're going to take a break. I got up and I went out into the parking lot and I just leaned against my car for about 15 minutes. The lawyer came out. He said, we're ready. Thank you. I said, you're welcome. We finished up the deposition. I packed up my bag. I went out to my car. As I was getting my gear into my car, the witness came out 
And all he did was look at me and he thanked me and he shook my hand. That was it. We later resolved the case favorably for both parties, but it was a resolution. And the lawyer told me, had I not done what I did at that deposition, the case never would have settled. And that was that was a pivotal moment because obviously litigation is expensive. And again, had I gone scorched, scorched earth on this witness, we would have gone to trial if I didn't get the case knocked out via motion. And trials are expensive, as you know. So I, I clearly knew that this guy was in distress in this deposition and it would serve no useful purpose for me, in fact, to step on his neck. So I just decided to take a break and that paid dividends. That's one of many examples of where emotional intelligence comes in handy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's so important now, especially where there seems to be culturally this need to, quote, win all the time. And, and it sounds like that was you described emotional intelligence as being aware of other people and then responding. I'll put my words on it, responding with a specific intent, with a with an outcome in mind. It's it's difficult for people to when you're in the heat of battle to slow down and worry about, well, would my client think that I was somehow not being aggressive enough to to take that break? What would you say to somebody who, you know, was worried about that with their client and and are, they're not quite sure how to, you know, be confident enough to make those decisions? What would you what would you tell a, a, an associate or a, a young partner who was trying to do this in an environment where maybe their firms wouldn't appreciate it? Well, one thing uh, I I think a legal education is a phenomenal one. And one of the things I learned in law school and ensuing years in practice was to think two, three, four moves ahead. It's like a chess game. It is, you know, I would describe it as a chess game, mental gymnastics, whatever phrase you want to use. So in that moment when this guy was in distress, this witness, I'm thinking two, three, four moves ahead that if I, again, bear down on this guy, he very well could clam up. And, and then I don't get anything out of him. Uh, he could then turn monosyllabic on me and give me yes, no answers. So I found over my career that allowing a witness, it's a little different in court, I'm talking depositions, but allowing a witness to kind of meander and feel comfortable, that's my job. If I'm deposing an adverse witness, I want that witness comfortable. Because with comfort comes chattiness, and with chattiness comes admissions, and admissions are helpful when you are <laughs> defending a claim. So it was really an analysis in real time of, okay, I think right now is a perfect time for a break. Let this guy decompress, get a hold of himself, um, and we then can continue, and, and I will get through the outline that I want to get through. I mean, that's another thing when I would take a deposition, a little off, off topic here, but I that's would okay. take a deposition and allow a witness. I always described it to young lawyers. It's like a canoe ride down a lazy river. You're in the canoe and you're allowing the river to take you wherever it takes you. I would let witnesses do that. I had specific, specific things I wanted out of them and I would make sure I got them, but I would let them take me where they want to take me because Allowing them to do that, you you would get a lot more. It's almost like silence, too. I would at many times just pause. You know, Doug, people don't like silence. Mm -hmm. They can't handle pregnant pauses. I mean, one of the things we do in the EQ leadership training is we have an exercise about listening where somebody tells you something and you stare at them for 10 seconds. That's it, 10 seconds. That makes people very uncomfortable. And I would insert pregnant pauses in my examinations all the time. And I would, the witness would start speaking so many times that their lawyer would jump out of the chair saying, there's no question pending, basically telling his client to shut up until I ask the next question. So silence, even silence is an effective litigation tool. 
Absolutely. Let, let's shift the context a bit from what you might do with an adversary in litigation to um, lawyers and partners managing their own teams. And there was a recent study you mentioned about the relationship between a partner's EQ and one of the biggest problems that all law firms have, and that's retaining and recruiting top talent. Tell me about that. All right. So many law firm leaders got to where they got uh, with irrespective of emotional intelligence. It might have been uh, related to seniority. Um, there's very little leadership training amongst law firm leaders. Mm -hmm. And many law firm leaders are not given candid feedback. At times, we all know, leaders can surround themselves with one of my favorite phrases, sycophants. They can surround themselves with people who will tell them what they want to hear. Uh, you had Michael Lord on, on one of your episodes, the, the recruiter. Uh, and he talked about a lack of self-evaluation. Um, and if somebody leaves, they must be a bad person or a bad lawyer. It's got nothing to do with us. And um, in fact, it does. So Major Lindsay in Africa, a talent search firm, uh, published a study last October. It was reported in Law 360 that plus or minus 60 percent of the associates are planning to leave. The respondent associates are planning to leave their law firm within the next year. And many in the leadership ranks have no idea why, because they don't take any interest in finding out why. Uh, and some of the responses were they just want to be treated like humans. That was one of the responses, uh, the associates. They don't even know my name. Uh, so leadership at law firms, they need to take more of an interest in what is going on with their teams. Walk the halls, find out what's going on. A perfect example is politics aside, President Bush 41 the older President Bush, when he died, the reports of this guy and what he knew about the people that worked in the White House were staggering. He knew birthdays. He knew anniversaries. He knew he would write personal notes. He knew what was going on with the White House staff and White House teams, the cooks, the valets, because he paid attention and he was interested in what was going on. So again, politics aside, by all accounts, 41 was a, a wonderful man because he took an interest in those around him. And I think if law firm leaders did more of that, they'd be able to retain staff. And it's well documented, the cost of turnover is staggering. So you, you spent a lot of your life in larger firms. Well, why do you think lawyers uh, are reluctant to take that kind of interest in, um, or what? maybe not reluctant, let's not characterize it. Why, why don't they? Um, what, what's caused this epidemic of kind of not caring? Uh, perhaps they don't because they were never uh, taught that it's an important um, leadership skill in retaining legal talent. I mean, Again, I passed the bar in 1988. I think the model back then was you, kid lawyer, you come onto the firm. Here are your billable hours. It's 2200 a year. Here's your billing sheet. Go work. And that's it. You want to come out of your office for water? You can do that. You got questions? If I'm around, I'll answer them. This is pre-email. If I'm mm -hmm. not, too bad. And that, that ties in with mentoring, too, um, the importance of mentoring for retention. But back to your question, I just don't think the law firm leaders are necessarily skilled in this because, again, it touches on the dreaded word emotion. And we, as lawyers, are supposed to be robotic, you know, like something out of a Stanley Kubrick movie. <laughs> Ironic that uh, now we're all the warrior, lawyers are we're all worried about AI, <laughs> but uh, you know what I've observed. I'm interested in your perspective on it. Is 
that when lawyers, we, we lawyers are working within our technical competency, going to court, negotiating a contract, whatever it is, there, there are rules and there are boundaries. And so when th those constraints give us comfort, and so we're, we're free to roam about the country and do our work. But the rules of dealing with people are so much less clear. And so I'll find, and, and you mentioned earlier the, um, the problem with grievances and lack of communication. And I've seen so many lawyers who will avoid conflict, who won't advocate even to be afraid to call a client to collect an invoice because they might hear something that makes them uncomfortable. Um, how can improving their EQ, to learning more about that, help them feel more comfortable where the rules aren't really clear? For starters, it, a lot of it is is packaging. So you've got to reach you've got to reach the leaders, and because the leaders set the tone for the firm, their behavior they model certain behavior. Uh, if if a if a law firm managing partner walks out at four in the afternoon and comes in at nine thirty the next day and walks out at four in the afternoon, that's mo modeling behavior to the associates mm -hmm. like. Well, I'm rowing the ship here. I have to put down 2300 on my billing sheet, but this managing partner is doing like 35 hours a week. So I think we, you need to penetrate the law firm leadership. And I think taking the word emotion out of it and packaging it differently, selling it, for lack of a better phrase, as perhaps a client relationship tool that mm. if you say, I'm going to I'm going to work with your associates so they can go out and they can not only attract clients, but they can retain clients. Uh, and, you know, back in the day, we, you had, um, you could put lawyers into three groups and a lot of people didn't like doing it, but you had minders, grinders, and finders, right? Mm, I remember. <laughs> yeah. So you had the finders. They were out on the hunt, rainmakers. You had the grinders. They were in the back room, just, uh, pumping out work. And then you had the minders, the administrative. Um, there's no reason you can't do all three. You Why you can't be a minder, a grinder, and a finder. But back in the day, you were siloed. Uh, so I think, I think it goes to client relationships because everybody wants an associate to grow his or her book. Uh, and many associates need a book if they want to move laterally. Uh, so I think if you you could reverse it and say, this is a client relationship tool, or this is a well-being issue. Um, mm. and, and maybe in the third slot, it's a people management issue, but people management is not very shiny. And a lot of law firm leaders don't like paying attention to that, um, <laughs> exactly. e even though they should. Um, but I, I'll, I'll share however many anecdotes you'd like about my relationship with clients and where emotional intelligence played a big, big part in it. Well, isn't it, isn't it interesting right now that, that it's, you know, when I moved on to the business side, I found that my legal training and experience was almost like a secret weapon. Sounds like even emotional intelligence can, can give a lawyer in this environment a real advantage, can it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the studies abound, not necessarily limited to the legal profession, that uh, the higher your emotional intelligence, the more money you can earn. It mm. puts you if you have an high, a if you have a high IQ or EQ, excuse me, it puts you in the top ninety percent of performers. Uh, there's a significant return on investment for organizations, including law firms, to in fact invest in emotional intelligence based training. Uh, there's one study which shows the return on investment to be almost fifteen hundred percent. And wow. that, that's embedded a lot in the um, retaining talent because, as we touched upon, it costs a lot to replace somebody. I mean, you bring an associate into a law firm, you're not going to make any money on that associate in the first three years. It, you might break even in year four. If you've spent all that time training in the first three years, haven't made a dime on that associate, and that associate ups and leaves because nobody knows his or her name. Nobody even cares that um, they may have a child at home or they may be interested in the opera. 
anything like that, any any sign of humanity, and they may up and leave. You've invested three years of training, and that goes right down the drain, and you've got to tee it up again. Yeah. In fact, that's one of the reasons that larger firm associates look to move to smaller firms because they, well, they might not be able to match in compensation. They certainly can make up with in, in quality of, of life. Uh, if this is so important, I know this, I'm a, I'm a leadership guy. We didn't learn about leadership in law school. We didn't learn about business things in law school. We certainly didn't learn about emotional intelligence, client relations, and, and all the stuff we're talking about in law school. Uh, are I know you've uh, you're closer to the law school folks than I am these days. Have you seen anything where law schools are are starting to to teach more of this stuff? These essential skills. Yeah, it is it is taking root, which is a good thing. And and just take one step back first. The skills you just mentioned that you weren't taught. Uh, I have a daughter. I have two daughters. My oldest is in law school, and uh, she is a second year. And when she went her first year. The school was touting its revolutionary, my word, fundamentals of lawyering program. And it had they had unveiled this maybe two years prior. So plus or minus 2020 fundamentals of lawyering, Doug. Uh, We I learned that when I clerked at a law firm in law school, I had a great mentor and this mentor taught me how to bill my time. This mentor put me on phone calls with um, claims representatives and others. So when I got to my firm as a newly minted associate, I actually knew how to uh, bill my time. Uh, So I was a little shocked, although I'm too old to be shocked, that fundamentals of lawyering would be so revolutionary. Uh, But there are law schools that are paying attention to it. As a, for instance, University of Miami has a three credit course on emotional intelligence. Uh, The Institute for Wellbeing in Law is a not-for-profit organization that Big Law founded a few years back, and its focus is on just that, well-being in the law. There's a conference that's coming up. They had one in 22, January of 22. They have another one next week. And there is a law school well-being track. There's three tracks. There's individual well-being, uh, organizational or firm well-being, and law school well-being. And I am presenting with a with a colleague on emotional intelligence for law students because it's important to seed this in law school. Uh, so there is a movement afoot to pay attention to it, um, without a doubt. But there's there's more work to do. Uh, you know, I've seen law schools that have during final exams, uh, rooms made available to students to pop bubble wrap to, to de-stress. Not sure that's, that's a winning play right there. That, that, you know, smacks of Band-Aid-esque conduct. Uh, we can, we can deal with that, uh, you know, under the self-management module of emotional intelligence. You know, part of that is, um, Meditation, mindfulness, sleep practices, things of that nature, self-management. Um, I am a firm believer that if you cannot manage yourself, you cannot manage others, period, full stop. Uh, so, yes, there you know, is. It, there are positive signs. There are positive signs. I, I would love to see. I'm, I'm going to a conference of CLE administrators uh, in uh, in the next week and uh, I, I would love to, and it's not really the administrators, it's the regulators to uh, allow broader teachings in CLEs for, for licensed lawyers on these sorts of topics, because they're, they're in my experience, having been a CLE administrator, um, there's so much focus on tactical, technical law and not on this. And this these sorts of skills are directly related to some of our biggest challenges when it comes to burnout and substance abuse and divorce and and other things, because um, one of the things about self it's self awareness of recognizing that something's going on and you need to change things. Um, we we change things around. So right, and you know you know, and- you, you touched on artificial intelligence and. Uh, you know, I did submit uh, the Institute for Wellbeing and the Law. The acronym is IWIL. 
I submitted to IWill last summer to present in next week. And there was a line in there, Doug. I said, with the advent of AI, lawyers need to be more human now than ever before. Uh, so I think, you know, the AI may have its thumb on the scale, but all the more reason why we need to humanize the other side and even it out. Uh, so it's, I think it's really, really important. Um, and it, and it just, for all the reasons we've spoken about. Yeah. So, it, you know, one of the things I, I think you're, you're coming to, and I love the point is that deciding to go get training in this or another area, um, I, I suppose you could look at it as a weakness or fixing a problem. Um, but I think a better, you use the word packaging. I think a better way to package it is we want to be a best firm to work for. We want to be um, compete in the war for talent. We want to have better client relationships. And teaching on these traditional, what are traditionally thought of as soft skills, like emotional intelligence, um, are specifically designed to do that. So if, if if you're, you know, if a listener is saying, gee, you know, I want to invest in that, I, I wouldn't approach it like a lot of lawyers do uh, as I got to fix a problem. So therefore I have to invest. It, it's more of I, I'm going to think strategically about the growth of my business and get out ahead of something. It's another so, tool in the toolbox. That's how yeah, I look it's at an important, it. Uh, and it affects so many other tools, right? It, well, it does. And again, I, I'm a big believer on, I, I use the word package, that's my word, on this being a client relationship issue. And I'll give you an example. So I did a lot yeah. of work for a large construction company. They have a fleet of trucks. They have dump trucks. They have concrete trucks. They have big trucks and quarries that can't, are, they're too big to drive over the road. So the company would bring me in when one of their drivers was sued. And these are Teamsters, they're union drivers. And I would walk in, you know, basically sent from corporate, air quotes, and the driver would look at me and I would look at the driver and there was tension because that driver doesn't know who I am. They don't know if they're in trouble or not. So a classic, typical icebreaker for me, Doug, would, would say, you're the driver. I'd say, Mr. Brown, my name is Carl Fix. Uh, you have been sued. I've been appointed by the company to represent you. And I would just like to share this with you. You are entering the world that I live in. I will give you guidance. I would ask you to allow me to guide you. Much as if I entered the world of truck driving with a commercial driver's license, which I don't have, I would be befuddled. I would look to you for guidance because you have the commercial driver's license. You are the professional driver. So if I got into your truck, I would look to you for guidance on how to drive it. I said, you're now in my truck. I will guide you. Just look to me. And you could see noticeably there was a decompression in the room. And then we were able to do business. And that, that was a very common tactic. And I learned that as a kid lawyer when I got involved representing police officers in civil rights litigation. Ooh. And, you know, they call it the fraternal order of police for a reason. It's a fraternity. And Carl Fix comes in with his, you know, lawyer suit. He's not in the fraternity. I would use a similar tactic with them saying, I'm on your team. I need, you know, I'm, I'm going to look to you if, if you put a gun on me. Uh, and a uniform, I would ask you to help me. How I, how do I become a good police officer? You know, how do I learn about the force continuum? Conversely, I'm going to guide you through this civil rights litigation. So those are skills I just picked up over the course of time. And then it, it just made things a lot smoother and I would get better results for the client. I love that. I love that. You know, one of the, the challenges, I think, you know, the vast majority of firms in this country are small firms. They don't have training managers or training budgets. And, you know, what could a small firm begin to do? Because this is not a one-time training event. It's not like I just go and and uh, I check the box and do the sexual harassment training. This is a, This is a cultural shift. Why is it important for a small firm to 
invest in this kind of skill building and how might they get started? Uh, well, for starters, it, it's important for a small firm because it's harder for a small firm to absorb the loss of somebody. And by loss, I mean departure. Uh, if you have a five lawyer firm with two partners and three associates, if one associate ups and leaves, then that's a heck of a, a load that's then put on the other lawyers. If you have a stable of 45 associates and one ups and leaves, you've got 44 others that are, that are going to row that boat. And there may not even be a ripple in the pond with a departure. So it's important, I think, for the smaller firms to pay more attention because they cannot absorb as easily as a, as a larger firm. And you could start by just raising awareness. I mean, here's a simple, uh, simple yet profound exercise in leadership training, uh, emotional intelligence training. Write down in the last 24 hours every emotion you've felt. And when you take inventory of that, it's shocking. In the last mm. 24 hours, every emotion that you felt, most people don't do that. But once you start raising awareness by that simple inventory, for instance, you, you can then, it's, again, it's, it's recognizing, understanding, and managing those emotions. So a, a small firm could start by doing a, just a lunch and learn. Uh, and there are other exercises that, that you can do. Um, the listening exercise, um, the connecting exercise. Um, so it's, it's an awareness issue. Um, even yourself, you can, you can, how, how do I feel in certain situations or can I read emotional cues? You know, I was thinking about us being together today and right over my shoulder is the Edward Hopper print Nighthawks. There are only four people in that photograph. There's not a lot going on, but there's a lot going on. You wonder, and, and this has been dissected. This, this is, of course, it's a knockoff, but it's a very famous painting um where you say what's going on is that an fbi agent uh are that is that couple are they breaking up what's going on so i did read an article on emotional intelligence and they said if you're uh on a plane and there's a tv and you're flying cross country watch the movie without sound and try to figure out what's going on by simply reading the emotional cues of the actors and I, that fascinated hmm. me i haven't done that yet i just read about this but three weeks ago, but uh, read the room. You, you can learn how to read a room and that pays dividends. Yeah. And often it, it I, I love that. You can do the same thing sitting at an airport. Um, and it requires us to slow down our cadence a little bit. And, and because when you're going super fast, the telephone poles become a blur on the side of the highway, but if you want to really see what's going on, you, you, you really do need to find a way to, to slow down just, a, just a tad. Um, I, when I'm working with my clients on, you know, strategic planning, we know lawyers are a lot, awful lot of, uh, we're control freaks and we like to be, know what's going on. So I've, I always find it paradoxical that, um, firms will generally just work really hard like crazy, but they won't take the time to set their GPS on where they want to go. They just want to go fast. And and so setting your GPS saying where you want to go and how you want to get there and how do you build your team to go the distance with these sorts of skills is critically important. Oh, without a doubt. Um, and, and again, it, you know, there is in the self-awareness and self-management, those two silos, even though uh, part of self-management is entirely dependent on self-awareness. I mean, self-management, again, mindfulness, um, well-being, it ties in together. If a firm recognizes that um, and they're just not, not going to beat their associates like rented mules. I mean, let's stop for one minute and look again, one minute. The, the highest salary for a first year associate now is uh plus or minus $250,000. That's a lot of money, Doug. Sure. Yeah. So what happens there? You've got one of three situations. You've got equity partners take less. They don't like that. Clients mm -hmm. pay more. They don't like that. Mm -hmm. Or you work the associates harder. It's going to be door number three. 
you know, I've been an equity partner. I didn't like it when my profits were cut. I've been a client. I didn't like it when a lawyer charges me more. So it falls in the camp of, well, we're paying this lawyer, this newly minted lawyer, $250,000. We're going to get a lot out of that person. And there is no time to pause like you just described. And as a result, uh, you know, these young lawyers saying, "Uh, yeah, you know what? I realize I have my JD and I realize I wanted to go into private practice, but I didn't sign up for this. It's a, it's a generational shift. Sure is. So we're, we're both in the business of helping leaders and, and, and law firms get better with these sorts of skills. Uh, and you know, one of the things I've observed is, um, there is this like DIY mentality in, in lawyers Ironically, well, lots of irony today, but ironically, the very thing that they would tell their clients not to do, don't represent yourself, that they'll, they'll try to work on this themselves. Well, how could bringing somebody in from the outside um, help a firm make or accelerate their progress in this area? Well, we talked uh, at the outset about self-evaluation. Uh, lawyers aren't great self-evaluators. So if you had somebody mm-hmm. come in from the outside to say, hey, um, here's what you're doing, you know, did well, do differently. Uh, You know, here's what you're doing well, here's perhaps what you can do differently. I invite you to be curious. Uh, You know, there's that feedback sandwich, uh, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, praise, tip, praise. Praise somebody, give them a tip, and then praise them. So you've got a a feedback sandwich. I think that, that would be helpful. And and you're right. I remember when I started practicing law, they had the 1040 EZ. I made $32,000 a year. It was under the $35,000 threshold. I could fill that out with a crayon. That was easy. Then I became an equity partner. We had K1s, we had this. And then I thought, yeah, I'm not going to do this. I, I had partners that did their own taxes. And I, I used to say to them, you, you counsel people to set up, let us set up your business, let us set up the LLC or let us incorporate your business because you'll mess it up and then it'll be more expensive to unravel. Yet you're doing your own taxes. That is that is indeed paradoxical. So I think somebody from the outside um, would be more helpful. And one, one thing is you need to be ready to accept what is said. You know, at one of my firms, we dropped $25,000 on a client survey study and then did absolutely nothing with it. And I thought, well, we should have just lit cigars with hundred dollar bills. Why did we spend 25 grand? So the law firm leadership needs to be ready to embrace whatever change comes with a Doug Brown or a Carl Fix who comes in to help them. They've got to be invested. I, I've in my 30 plus year career, I've seen initiatives that litter the floor dead on arrival because they were not embraced by leadership. It needs to come from the top down. 100%, which includes the leaders visibly participating rather than saying, you people go take this training while I go and play golf or something. Um, Well well said. So, you know, teased at the beginning, um, in addition to being a lawyer and helping people with this, you're an endurance athlete. Tell us a little bit about this endurance, about what you do. And because I, I find that that's fascinating. It was and remains one of my tools to um, my productivity. I, for the first five years of my legal career, I was all in 100%, full throttle, 80, 90 hours a week, totally neglecting my body. I took care of the new car that I bought with my $32,000 salary better than I took care of my body. Doug, I would, I would clean the rims of my new car with a toothbrush. And five years in, I said, what the heck is going on? Because I was very athletic as a kid in high school and college. And then I fell off a cliff and I realized this is not sustainable. So I basically got back into shape and I haven't stopped. And what it does, it just provides a lot of clarity. I had a standing date with a friend. Uh, We used to run 10 miles every Friday morning at 530 in the morning. We'd be done 
by 6.45. I'd be in the office 7.30, 7.45, ready to go. And I could, I could just handle things that came, on, came at me because uh, things come at you fast, as you know. In the mm-hmm. practice of law, you, you're driving to work or taking the train or doing whatever you're doing, and you have a punch list in your head. I'm going to do items one through ten today. At item two, there's a crisis, and items three through ten never get touched, totally derailed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I just found that um, when I work out in the morning, I own the workout, and nobody can take it from me. And it just allowed me to handle what came at me. It was a joke amongst my colleagues when I would go into a, a partner or friend's office and say, hey, Doug, I got this idea. And then Doug would look at me and say, oh, so you worked out this morning? And I'd say, yeah, I worked out. <laughs> you know, when I was when I run or ride, that's when I, as I mentioned before, we went live today. I was on the bike this morning, the stationary bike. And I had a few thoughts about today's podcast. That 30 minutes on the bike this morning cleared out some clutter and got me a little more dialed in for what we were going to talk about. So I've just found it useful over my career. It has, um, and again, it's a high stress profession. Mm -hmm. I am supportive of my daughter. She is going in with eyes wide open. She wants to go into private practice and she knows from having grown up with me as her father, that a lot goes into it. So she's going in eyes wide open. Uh, And I think that's a good thing. And I just have found these, and I'm very goal oriented. So the endurance thing, it's like, yeah, so this month I want to ride 500 miles. So we'll set that as a goal and then we'll go for it. Um, It's just, it's just been very helpful to navigate a stressful profession. Yeah, and all these and all these things are connected. I, it took me a lot longer than you took you to to realize something. I shared it when I was giving a, a presentation in New York State Bar Association. I was sitting next to a managing partner of a big New York firm, and I made this comment from the stage. and And afterwards, he he looked at me like I never thought of that before. He's a really smart, successful lawyer. And the comment I made was um, that. Our lives get better when we recognize that taking care of ourself is not selfish, that it actually increases our capacity to help other people and to show up um, productively and to be our best selves. And that's something that uh, this topic of emotional intelligence is essential for that, listening to yourself, listening to your body, listening to other people. Um, so I, I really appreciate uh, you coming on today. We could probably do a lot more topics and lots of other things. But, you know, if if um, if our audience wanted to get in touch with you and, and learn more about your your speaking and training and other things, how would they do that, Carl? You can do it one of three ways. You can call me. My my <laughs> cell phone is 860-944-3021. Uh, email is Carl, C-A-R-L, at Carl Fix, C-A-R-L-F-I-C-K-S dot com, or my website, www.carlfix.com. Uh, and I do appreciate so much, Doug, you having me on. If I just one thought to pull the thread. Yeah, give you us, just, you take us, take us out. Give us the closing thought for the day. The closing thought would be what you just touched on about it taking care of yourself is not selfish. If you think about the wheel of service, we are in service to others. We are in service to our family, to our partners, whether they're domestic or or whether they're business. We're in uh, service to the community, uh, philanthropic groups, that wheel of service. If you're offline, you're not in service to any of them. There is a major domino effect uh, if you're knocked out of commission for whatever reason. So uh, once I realized, again, after five years of the practice, why the heck am I taking care of this 1990 Thunderbird, which was my new car, better than my body? And this is not sustainable, so I need to pay attention to it. And, you know, I, I say I'm an endurance athlete. Well, at times litigation is an endurance sport. There was one case. I had a trial in 2012 for a barge accident on the Hudson River in 2004. That was eight years. That's a long fight. So Mm. that's an endurance 
event right there. So it can be the practice of law is analogous, in my humble opinion, to an endurance event. So there's parallels, they abound. But thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Carl. You're doing great, important work out there. So uh, keep up the good fight. And I want to thank uh, our uh, viewers and listeners for joining us. And uh, we're going to wrap it up today uh, for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks again.